Good morning, Baxter. Good morning. Um, why are we here today? We're here today to discuss um, weaponry and uh, yeah, slaying our fellow man at a distance, which as I said earlier in uh, my piece on human evolution is one of the great leaps that we managed to make. Uh, we're here today to discuss another little ripple plug. So this is another mechanical solution uh, to a problem that people face, which is the inability to shoot their fellow man from a long way away. Um, there might be deemed to be a problem that man has created rather than one that he now has to solve, but there you have it. So, one of the first things that Ripple was actually uh, tasked with doing was to come up with a new way of making a projectile weapon, uh, which could be used in an offensive and a defensive um, uh, way uh, against enemy ships, enemy people, enemy planes, or whatever it happens to be. So. Mankind embracing missile weapons is one of the things that has really made us who we are today. You know, we've, we've, we've since we've thrown spears at mammoths rather than diving on them and biting them as perhaps our simian ancestors did. Um, and yet we've made a like, surprisingly little progress. Um, for the vast majority of human technological development, we've relied on the strength of our arms, our actual ability to, to throw something, if you like, as fast as we can, which is as sharp as possible in order to try and hit something at a distance. Um, there's a bit of a paradigm shift when we realise that you could actually store a certain amount of energy from a slow motion requiring a lot of strength that could be released quickly. So the bow and the crossbow are probably the best examples of this. You have a long slow motion of the arm which stores the energy in the bent piece of wood and then you release it and all of the energy that you put in is placed into the projectile very very quickly in one hit allowing a great deal more range and presumably you have the exact same amount of momentum transferred by the arrow as you do by the spear but because the arrow's head is so much smaller it hits with more force has greater penetrating power as uh, the poor old French Agincourt found out uh, to their cost. After the bow, um, and indeed crossing over with the bow, because at the Battle of Cressé there were cannons, and we realised you could actually extract uh, energy from chemicals using gunpowder, which is apparently invented in China, where you have a stored chemical energy plug, you have a projectile, a cannonball, you burn uh, the fuel in the back of the gun and the cannonball uh, flies out of the front. And actually, since the invention of the first cannon, we haven't actually moved very far along from that. We still uh, have the majority of our guns being long tubes into which you place a projectile, and at the, behind it you have a charge, although it's changed from being gunpowder to being cordite now. You burn the charge, uh, the hot gas expands, and the bullet flies out of the front of the gun. Um, now, those kind of weapons have a real advantage, which is that the projectile itself is cheap. It's just a lump of metal. You don't have to pay very much. You can have a whole stack of them on your brass monkey or whatever, and you just load them up and fire them, and if you miss, it's no big deal. Um, and you know, if you hit, then good. Um, and so there is an appeal to this kind of projectile weapon, a thing that literally just throws a lump of material. It doesn't have an exploding charge inside of it. It doesn't have uh, any onboard uh, kind of like, you know, propellant like a rocket or a missile, which can cost, you know, thousands and thousands, if not millions of pounds each. Uh, each projectile only costs, you know, kind of a few, few hundred or thousand pounds. Uh, you fire it over long distance, and when it arrives, it imparts its energy purely through kinetics, so it's moving so fast uh, that it punctures the hull of the ship or whatever it is that you're shooting at. Um, but there is a bit of a limitation, and the limitation on burning a fuel on the back of the gun is that when you blow something up or whatever, it produces a shockwave, and the shockwave moves at a, a fixed rate uh, through the air. The fastest you could ever hope that the bullet would leave the gun is the speed of the shockwave. It can't go any quicker than that because it's the shockwave that's pushing it and obviously it's going to go slower than that because its inertia is going to resist the acceleration. You can try putting more cordite in the gun, but once the bullet has left the end of the gun and that seal is broken, any extra cordite burning in the gun is wasted. You know, an enormous cloud of flames coming out. It looks great, but it doesn't actually push the missile any faster. So what you really like to have is a gun where you, when you fire it, nothing comes out of the end except the projectile. Um, so if you want to fire something faster or further, what you need is more time to accelerate that object because the inertia is going to push back against the shockwave. The longer it's pushed, the faster it will get. 
but as soon as it leaves the barrel of the gun, of course, it can go no faster. That's its muzzle velocity, and from there on in, it's it's falling towards the earth 9.8 meters per second or whatever, unless you fire. Um, and so, if you want to fire a projectile quicker, you need a longer barrel. Uh, so, you know, pistol bang bang, you get like a fairly fast bullet. But if you really want to shoot over a long range, you need a sniper rifle, which obviously are enormously long. It means you've got more time to impart kinetic energy to your bullet before it leaves the barrel of your gun. And so to get these higher muzzle velocities, you need a larger um, or longer length uh, barrel. Um, banging guns, if you like, as opposed to whooshing missiles, reach their kind of you know, apogee, I guess, with um, the super gun, the Iraqi super gun, which is an enormous long barrel gun, which actually had to be laid out on a hillside because it was so large, which obviously meant it was impossible to aim the damn thing. Um, but that was one way in which Saddam Hussein was thinking that perhaps he could actually target um, far neighbours in the absence of intercontinental ballistic missiles simply by having a gun with a barrel long enough to accelerate the projectile fast enough to cover the distance once it got out of the end. But there is another way of accelerating a projectile that doesn't rely on the speed of the shockwave generated by a burning charge, uh, and that's using an electromagnetic slingshot. So, what they refer to as a rail gun. So uh, if you have a large electromagnet and you have a ferrous object, the large electromagnet will attract the ferrous object. And so you can use it essentially as a catapult and you can fire the thing. Uh, if you have a barrel with a series of electromagnets up the barrel, if you like, um, you can accelerate the object. And because uh, electromagnets work on um, uh, electricity as opposed to burning charges, the essential the ability to deliver the kinetic energy to the object there is no speed limit to it, essentially. There is no shockwave associated with it. Uh, as long as the magnets are strong enough um, and the charge is high enough um, to accelerate the object, you can accelerate the object up to, to tremendous muzzle velocities. So the American Navy had a, a railgun project. You, know, you see the footage of it online. They fire this gun and it can fire through you know, kind of plate after plate of steel. You know, this thing is absolutely extraordinary with this little, this little dart. Um, and the main advantage of it is that we can we can shoot uh, enemy uh, kind of installations and ships hundreds of miles away, and we can shoot them on other continents. But it's the ability to shoot them cheaply, quickly, over and over again, and fire that gun um, without having to spend large amounts of money each time. Also, a tiny object like uh, the um, uranium depleted uranium dart from a from a rail gun is almost impossible to shoot out of the sky. Whereas a larger object with control mechanisms and with a kind of like a plume of hot gas coming out of the back which is just you know, dying to be chased by some heat seeking missile is significantly easier. Um, it's possible to imagine a situation in which you can shoot an exocet before it reaches your ship. It's very difficult to imagine a situation in which you could shoot a standard metal lump projectile that was travelling at the same speed uh, coming towards you. So a lot of energy, a lot of, kind of mental energy has been put into trying to work out whether using electromagnetism you can create these hypersonic, you know, super fast weapons which are very hard to shoot down. Um, but one by one, uh, they've generally fallen by the wayside uh, for a number of, of reasons, um, largely to do with the fact that if you want the muzzle velocity that's you know, thousands of miles an hour, the amount of time that the projectile spends in the gun is tiny because you accelerate it from zero smoothly to muzzle velocity in the length of the barrel, and so it's hardly in the barrel for any period of time at all, which means it has this enormous spike of energy which you have to generate of electrical energy in order to impart that amount of kinetic energy to the, to the projectile in that short space of time. If you had a barrel a mile long, one like the Iraqi supergun, especially if that barrel was um, evacuated, you wouldn't need anywhere near so much uh, kind of, or anywhere near such a high spike of energy input. You could just more smoothly accelerate the projectile with a far lower uh, electric charge because you have longer to impart speed to it before it leaves the barrel, which makes it an easier proposition. You don't have to have this, you know, like a, a way of generating that amount of clout in that short period of time. So we at Ripple. I uh, started to think about whether there were ways in which you could escape, if you like, from the, from the tyranny of the gun barrel length, from the fact that you have to get from zero to hero in this very, very short space of time without having to have some enormous unwieldy you know, gun mounted on a, on a train track or something in order, to, in order to shoot large distances. The other problem with rail guns is the muzzle velocity is so high that the barrel actually tends to wear out the speed of the projectile passing through it. Um, atomizes the barrel effectively, so after a certain number of shots it's junk and you have to replace the interior of the barrel. 
they get around this to an extent by wrapping the dart in an aluminium case so that the, the aluminium case perishes um, with the friction. But even then, each shot produces a kind of cloud of, uh, kind of steel filings out of the end of the gun uh, and the gun wears down. But what we uh, have come up with as a solution to these limitations on the rail gun is actually something which is really rather really special because the ripple gun has some odd characteristics. So the ripple gun has a very strange characteristic, which is that if you fire a projectile from the ripple gun, which is just a lump of metal, and you fire it at the same speed as the muzzle velocity of a standard rail gun, the ripple projectile travels three times as far. It has massively increased range at the same muzzle velocity. It can shoot around corners, which is really rather odd. Theoretically, you could shoot the gun, which is doff, but it is achievable. Um, it can be repeat fired. Uh, there are ways in which it can be used where it doesn't produce a recoil, which you know, seems to be counterintuitive. But essentially, there have been very few great leaps forward in projectile weapons technology. Men have thrown stones, They've then gone on to spears, you then have the bow, and then you have the gun. The biggest advancement in the gun uh, after Cressy was the breech loading gun, i.e. a gun which you load from the back rather than the front, which increased your rate of fire. Um, and the guns that we have now, so the non-missile uh, guns, the standard cordite powered guns, are pretty much the same guns as Armstrong was producing in the Victorian era, but with modifications. The Ripple Railgun represents a complete change. It's as big a change as going from the bow uh, to the gun. It's a bigger change than going from the muzzle loader uh, to the breech loader. It produces a, a weapon with completely different projectile characteristics, um, which could be used on a modern battlefield, especially in um, conjunction with satellite uh, technology, to produce some really quite astounding effects. Um, it can even uh, fire uh, projectiles which um, detonate at a chosen distance ahead of the front of the gun into a kind of cloud of supersonic shrapnel, but again without a charge being on board. Uh, so we think that it's pretty exciting, and if you've got a lot of kill and do, I would recommend that you click this link here and have a look at the, uh, and have a look at the Ripple Railgun. Because it's uh, yeah, it's a really, really, uh, really, really exciting paradigm shift in projectile weapons technology, and um, yeah, we think it has a future. So uh, yeah, feel free to have a look. Okay, I just I feel compelled to add. Thank you, Baxter. I feel compelled to add that there's also um, uh, a new um, application of the of the technology of the Ripple Railgun technology in the uh, realm of nuclear fusion. Uh, Sorry, yeah. uh, in accelerating um, the hydrogen pellets to a, to a velocity uh, that, that enables the, the reaction to occur um, further down in the system. We can't, the problem is that we can't talk too much about this, uh, this technology without fundamentally giving the game away. So um, we would be very interested to talk to people who have the capability and general motivation to take this and run with it with our assistance. Um, and again, that requires um, uh, a level of secrecy, and so, uh, but we'd be very interested to talk to everyone. Well, also, I also feel that I would like to say before people kind of like accuse me of being um, you know, a baddie, you don't want to be a baddie, um, that the, uh, the idea of a projectile weapon that fires a single item is actually significantly more humane than one that fires an exploding charge. If you fire something that explodes on impact, you're destroying everything within the blast radius and you haven't got a scooby-doo what will be there when that missile arrives you know during the 20th century a lot of the effort went into developing weapons that would just destroy enormous swathes of area blow up cities goodness knows what and there's a lot to be said for having something that could be targeted and only hit the target that it's fired at um, rather than um, having to have a kind of a broad brush approach <laughs> so you know war uh, conflict um, is still part of our lives and I suspect that it will always be. Uh, and the best weapons are the ones um, which destroy only those things uh, that you've made the decision need to be destroyed and nothing else, which projectile weapons, which fire a single object can do, whereas weapons that tend to explode, you really have no control over what you're gonna blow up at the same time. It's been brought to my attention recently uh, that there's a use for very high or kind of hypersonic projectiles in nuclear fusion. 
uh, which wasn't something I was thinking about when we developed the Ripple uh, railgun. Um, but essentially nuclear flu fusion is where you cause uh, atoms to fuse together, so say hydrogen atoms to fuse together into helium atoms and it reduces energy at the same time which you can then use to, to power your um, blender, whatever it is you want to use for your electric car. Uh, it's the power source that fuels the universe insofar as it's what keeps stars uh, burning. And from very uh, small amounts of fuel, you can generate enormous amounts of energy and you don't produce any greenhouse gases. I believe uh, the, uh, the water is the byproduct of some of these processes, but that really is about it. Um, but in order to get fusion to happen, what you need to do essentially is crush uh, hydrogen atoms together. So the electromagnetic repulsion of the hydrogen atoms, the electrons orbiting the hydrogen atoms, keeps them apart. But if you can push them together to the point at which the strong nuclear force can reach out one of its big meaty arms uh, from the nucleus one to the nucleus the other, they bind together using the strong nuclear force uh, and heat um, is produced in that collision. Uh, the way in which it happens um, inside of stars and inside of uh, atom bombs, um, well not inside of atom bombs, but inside of stars is through gravity, so the gravity crushes the, the hydrogen uh, nuclei closer and closer until they're within uh, proximity. Um, uh, the same uh, process is used in fusion bombs uh, where you fire uh, the two uranium charges together and you get this you know, uh, collision of the correct uh, kinetic power to, to cause those atoms to start fusing at which the shock wave from the initial explosion then goes on and causes more fusion in a hydrogen fuel cell behind the head of the missile. So what you're trying to generate in order to, to have fusion is pressure you need to generate an extraordinary amount of pressure in order to, to force uh, things together. So that can be uh, by firing lasers, uh, things like tritium. Um, but there is also another, what you might call like a steampunk methodology, which is that you fire uh, a tiny projectile um, at your fuel load and the impact generates the necessary pressures to cause that fusion to begin. But in order for that to happen, you have to be able to produce uh, a projectile which is going at just absurd speeds, these nine kilometers a second or something like that. 9,000. So you've got the same uh, problem as you have uh, with the gun, which is that you start off with a projectile at rest, you need to end up with a projectile going at that speed, and you somehow have to get the kinetic energy into it during the period during which it's accelerating. The longer that period can be, the more attainable uh, that outcome is. If you're trying to get it up to muzzle velocity in a very short space of time, you've got a real problem because you have to deliver all that energy quickly. If you're accelerating it at a very slow rate, then you've got a far uh, better chance of achieving that kind of muzzle velocity. So it may well be that the method that we use in the Ripple Railgun can also have uh, uh, usages um, in fusion because it's the same basic uh, challenge, which is how to get something within a reasonable uh, actual kind of three-dimensional space to accelerate it up uh, to these extraordinary muscle velocities. You know, uh, the Ripple Railgun can do it with a, with a projectile for shooting a ship, it can also do it um, with projectiles for fusion. Um, and my personal belief is uh, that using the standard what you might call linear acceleration of a gun um, won't, uh, has reached its limitations if you like, but that there is another way um, and that it's going to open a whole new uh, series of doors uh, to people who want to shoot stuff. Yeah, definitely the US Navy railgun being mothballed recently um, is, I think, indicative of that. So what you're basically saying, Baxter, is that the Ripple Railgun concept um, can uh, improve lethality, accuracy, efficient warfighting, whilst also at the same time providing part of the system that might help save the planet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's very hard to see all ends. I mean, you come up with a new form of technology and then it gets put to all kinds of uses. Essentially, the Ripple Railgun, the task that it's been given is to accelerate an object up to a ridiculous kind of rate of movement um, in a kind of like a, an efficient and deliverable way. Um, as to the ends to which that fast-moving projectile are put, it may well be that there's a whole raft of them. Um, it's not uh, for me really to, to muse as to, as to what uses it could be put, um, but a compact system that can reduce a very high muzzle velocity, I have no doubt will find all kinds of usages in industry, um, defence and, and other, other areas. And if you want to find out more, then uh, drop us a line. Yeah, sign the NDA. Yeah. Thank you.